so my topic is on stone tools and rock art. I will give a brief overview of the global scenario and the relevance of the Indian information. And when I say India, I'm talking about South Asia in general. Um, now just to review, uh, earliest hominin evidence starts at 7 million based on current fossils, including bipedalism. Then 3.3 million years ago, we have the oldest stone tools, and then the oldest evidence of butchery at 2.6 million, when the older one appears. Our genus Homo appears at 2.4 million, and hominins leave Africa before 2.2 million, when they, when they reach China, in fact, by that time. And the Acheulean appears in Africa at 1.7 or 1.8 million. And fire evidence at the moment is 1.5 million years old. Middle Paleolithic emerges between 500,000 and 400,000. And Neanderthals evolve in Europe. And then the oldest berries are found after 350,000. Our species appears almost at the same time, 315,000 years ago. And then it reaches Europe, then it reaches Levant, and then by 100,000, it reaches China. All these microliths appear 65,000 years ago. And then Homo sapiens arrives again into Europe at 50,000, roughly, and replaces the Neanderthals. And Neanderthals, and then another species, Homo floresiensis, in Southeast Asia become extinct between 50,000 and 25,000. And as you know from recent news, now we have the oldest microliths outside of Africa, 48,000 year old technology from Sri Lanka. And then 10,000 years ago, we had the transition from Mesolithic to Neolithic. And based on current evidence all over the world, we have at least six genera and 30 species, over 30 species reported, uh, although the names are debated. This is how many are known so far. And if you look at technology, it's dominated by stone tools because stone has survived. We have 3.3 million years onwards, but between 3.3 million and 2.6 million, there's no evidence. Lomequian is only one site, but after 2.6 million, there's evidence of continuity as well as dispersals across the world. Lomequian, Oldowan, and Acheulean belong to Lower Paleolithic, and then we have Middle Paleolithic different technologies then upper paleolithic phase, and then the microlithic phase. So older one in South Asia. We know that it reaches Europe by 1.8 million, it reaches China by 2.1 million, but is there evidence in India? These sites have been reported from Shivaliks and Narmada Valley, but at the moment, we don't have any convincing evidences. No sites have been excavated, no sites have been properly dated, but the best known evidence comes from Rivat, in Papi Hills in Pakistan. And recently, uh, this evidence on the top right was reported from Masol near Chandigarh. If you look at the summary, there's no evidence, 1.5 million euro older evidence so far from excavated or data context. And the cut marks reported from Masol may have been made through other processes. It's not clear if it cut marks from stone tools. This evidence suggests that there is an early presence of hominins in India. The ecology was right, the climatic conditions were right, raw materials were there, but at the moment we have no convincing older one sites yet in the Indian subcontinent. The oldest evidence starts with Acheulean. Acheulean is basically represented by hand axes and cleavers, but older one tools continue, like flake tools, scrapers, choppers, cores. So basically, Acheulean is older one with biphases. We have some sites like this, Olorgaceli in Africa, with thousands of biphases. And then in some cases, we have single biphase sites or off sites, representing different types of adaptations, different types of land use. Now, just a summary of the Acheulean. It was used and innovated by multiple species over time from Erectus, Antecessor, Hyderbagensis, Neanderthalensis, and Sapiens. The earliest Sapiens were the ones to use some of the last biophases in the Ashwin. Large flakes were being used for the first time. Older one evidence was much smaller. And split, flaking strategies went from unimarginal and bimarginal to unifacial and 
bifacial. And the large flake Acheulean, or LFA, continues until 250,000 in Africa and maybe 120,000 in India. It represents increased meat eating and hunting, increased cognition, adaptation to more diverse environments, and represents proper culture for the first time in archaeological record. Toolkits become more refined and specialized over time, and the size of the bifaces slowly decreases over time. So we have uh, sites all over, all over India, all our subcontinent, Acheulean sites, early Acheulean and late Acheulean, but in some places they're absent. Ganga Valley, they're absent. Southernmost India and Kerala, they're absent. Northeast India, they're absent. So there's pockets of Acheulean absence. Then we have Isampur. Isampur is one site which is possibly 1.2 million years old, but it's unique more because it's in a quarry context where the raw material extraction, biface manufacture, utilization, and discard are all preserved at one site, very rare. But the oldest evidence is Atirampakkam, which is about 1.5 million years old, uh, suggesting rapid dispersal to India soon after innovation in Africa. Then Bimetka is also there, very unique, because this is one of the few sites which has a continuous sequence from Acheulean to Mesolithic, but also because the Acheulean evidence is in rock shelter context. All other sites in India so far known come from open air context. This is the only rock shelter context. So what are the changes that occurred after Acheulean? The transition from lower Paleolithic to middle Paleolithic. It takes place between 500,000 and 300,000. It's called Middle Stone Age in Africa and appears to happen earliest over there. Large bifaces decrease. LCT means large cutting tools, or they disappear. Domination of prepared core technology, and then followed by the Valwa technology. Increased use of fine grain raw materials instead of coarse grain. Appearance of new tool types such as points, and this reflects hunting. And also blades appear at this time. There's beginning of hafting uh, projectile points to wooden shafts. So they're attaching stone points to wooden handles to make spears. And it's the beginning of significant cave occupation or rock shelter occupation. Before this time, there was not much cave occupation. And there's innovation of regional technology variants like Sangoan and Lumbaman and Musterian also. The, the, the Neanderthals invent Musterian in Europe and Levant. So new species come up and new technologies also come up at this time. So what's happening between 400,000 and 300,000 is parallel technological and biological evolution. The transition is happening at the same time in Africa, Levant, Europe, and India. And same thing seems to be happening biologically. We have Neanderthals appearing. We have Hydrobagensis evolving. We have something similar evolving in China. And then we have Homo sapiens evolving in Africa. And this is when we come to the late Pleistocene period, about 125,000 years onwards. This phase preserves lower, middle, and upper Paleolithic. Plus, microlithic technologies and many are overlapping. with each other after 16 by so debated in ostrich. And finally, it witnesses the arrival of Homo sapiens across the old world and into India in replacement of archaic populations. One has to keep in mind there were multiple waves of Homo sapien dispersals, starting at 200,000 onwards into Europe, Levant, China, India. And then at this time, we also have the development of a Selenian technology. Historically, it was thought to be contemporary with Acheulean, but at the moment, most evidence suggests it is post Acheulean, so possibly Middle Paleolithic, Upper Paleolithic, and Mesolithic in age. So, the whole question is now late Pleistocene when did first moderns arrive, and what technology did they bring with them? The fossil evidence suggests Homo sapiens arrived around 40,000 years ago based on fossils in Sri Lanka. 
But then we have microliths also appearing at different places in central India, in Sri Lanka at 48,000. So that's another benchmark for arrival of Homo sapiens. And then we also have a possible young middle Paleolithic from South India, which is about 77,000 years old, also belonging to Homo sapiens, perhaps. But this is a controversial site, and it's not clear if it's Homo sapiens or a different species. This makes it complicated because we have early middle Paleolithic emerging now in Atirambakkam at around 400,000 years ago. So what's happening is an older development of middle Paleolithic. That puts the younger middle Paleolithic into question. It may not be belong to Homo sapiens, or maybe the earlier evidence belongs to archaics and the younger evidence belongs to Homo sapiens. We don't know because we don't have no fossils. And between 400,000 and 77,000, we have large bifaces and small bifaces appearing and disappearing at different sites. It's very uneven. So it's not clear if Homo sapiens arrives before the Michaelithic phase. This is followed by Upper Paleolithic. This is basically dominated by laminar technology, which has blades and burins, and also it has a lot of burins and uh, bone tools. But in India, it's enigmatic because we have these tool types overlapping, overlapping with microliths and overlapping with middle pelvic. We only have one site that is dated, 45,000 years old. No other site has been properly excavated or dated. It's geographically variable and missing in some places. So large blades are missing, replaced by microliths. And inclusion within the late Paleolithic label may undermine regional diversity and mask truly exclusive transitional entities. So sites with purely upper Paleolithic elements need to be excavated and studied. So this is what I'm talking about, where you have different technologies overlapping. Around 45,000 years ago, researchers have reported middle Paleolithic, Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic from different locations across the subcontinent. So we don't know which species was making which tools and how long it took the Homo sapiens to replace archaics. Then we come to the Mesolithic. Again, tools become smaller and more specialized. This is an example of crescents and lunates, how they, how they differ in typology and morphology. And this is also the beginning of pressure flaking with antlers and later on with copper. And there's a debate on the appearance of microliths in India, whether they were innovated in India or introduced from outside. It's not clear because the root, which is upper Paleolithic, is ambiguous. And no excavations have been done. There is occurrence and spread by 48,000 onwards. Dhaba and Metakeri in Madhya Pradesh, and Fahi and Lena in Sri Lanka, all the same age. Sri Lanka evidence shows hunting, hunting adaptations in rainforest context. Technology of microliths continues well into historical times. So well into medieval times, in fact. Uh, Hunter-gatherers were using this uh, into historical times and even colonial times. Prehistoric rock art is most frequently associated with Paleolithic, which is characterized by polished axes. So microliths continue late and polished axes continue late into the historical phase. And the Neolithic evidence, especially polished axes and other related evidence, is missing in Western and Central India. Everywhere else it's present. So what are the uses of prehistoric archaeology? What can we learn from it? We can learn about settlement systems, possible development of language, hunting behaviors, subsistence, the fossil record, level of cognition and memory, possible population levels, environmental adaptations, and other aspects, beginning of culture, for example. So many, many things we can understand from stone tools and not just stone technology, ivory, bone, and soft rocks. Then we have different types of Boulders. 
And then large cores found more and more in the Acheulean to make large biophases. These photographs are from Narmada Valley in uh, Yemen. And then debitage. Debitage is very important because it represents evidence of primary site and also possible refitting uh, of the site uh, in the assemblage to understand the reduction sequence. Then we have evidence of microflaking and step flaking. Uh, and this is from utilization of the artifacts, from cutting, slicing, chopping, scraping. And hafting evidence actually starts very early, around 500,000 or 400,000 years ago on spears and gradually develops into bows and arrows. And also later on in the Neolithic with the axes. So what, what can we do? With an assemblage, what is that all the stages representing? Laboratory research, the levels of assemblages, this is experimental work, and finally, report writing and publication. And I'll talk about it a little bit more detail. So working with lithics, we can do various studies. We can study the stone tools. We can do refitting. We can look at different types of attributes. We can look at the impact of different rocks on the bones, on the wood. We can look at cognition levels, look at technological change or lack of change, for example. Many, many things we can understand. And these are just two different sets of attributes, qualitative versus quantitative. On the left, we have qualitative. And just, for example, the stratigraphic context, the condition of the specimens, the shape of the edge. So these are basically descriptive attributes. On the right, we have quantitative or measurable attributes like length, width, breadth, the size of the platform, angle, amount of cortex, the weight of the specimen, degree of symmetry. And the statistics can be done more on the quantitative attributes than the qualitative attributes. However, both sets of attributes are necessary to understand an assemblage as a whole. So select Indian questions that can be answered for Indian archeology span through experimental uh, studies. What kind of subsistence behaviors does Indian Paleolithic record reflect? What was the function of the artifacts? What was the function of the cleavers, of the burins, of the bone tools? What was the link between different assemblage compositions and different raw materials? Were some raw materials more efficient than others, like basalt versus quartzite? This can be tested in the lab by doing different tasks. Can transitional lithic evidences be identified through replication? Again, middle Paleolithic, there was a long transition from lower to middle. But from middle to upper, the transition seems very short. So we can study this through replication. Also, what are the explanations for the absence of specific tool types in some regions of South Asia? For example, projectile points are missing in some places. Bifaces are missing. Polished axes are missing. Can we talk about environment, ecology, and lack of technologies? <clears throat> what kind of methods can we apply for lithic studies? One is 3D digital scan, XRF or X-ray fluorescence, FTIR, SEM, geometric morphometrics. We can document social transmission. So we can nap in a group and one expert can teach a novice and we can see the rate of change, the speed of learning, there's many, many things we can learn just about social transmission. We can do ethnoarchaeology on current hunter-gatherer or pastoral groups. We can do GIS analysis, not only at landscape level, but at the assemblage level. We can do actualistic studies and site formation processes at different uh, localities. We can also study non-stone materials, such as wood and bone, bamboo, and also comparisons of large published databases. Now we have a lot of information, a lot of publications, which need to be compared. And of course, experimental mapping and tool use. Now, just for people who want to get into experimental archaeology, there's some tips and some rules to keep in mind. Always work under the guidance of an expert. And it's better to have problem-oriented approach and systematic planning instead of random napping. It's good to learn basic
notification and statistics, always keep a first aid kit handy. You'll be surprised how many injuries you can have when you're beginning to flint map. And use poor raw material for practice. Don't use good quality raw material until you have a proper research question in mind and until you're good at mapping. Carry out extensive documentation and also take GPS locations of the raw materials collected in the field. And finally, keep a detailed lab diary to keep progress of your, <coughs> of your learning and your uh, improvement. Some other things to keep in mind, morals and ethics in experimental archeology. span In the West, there's commercialization of replicated artifacts. They're often sold, but there's also contextual planting. Ar archeologists are planting replicated artifacts at sites and getting caught. There's also accidental mixing that can happen of replication and original artifacts. So we should be careful about that. Also, antlers are used as soft. In India, it's not easy to get antler without have any animal parts, in fact. So one reason to get the antlers from the proper authorities. But in the West, antlers are easily available commercially. And also, the question to kill or not to kill for experimental butchery. It's unethical to kill an animal for butchery. Butchery can be done on an animal that has naturally died, but never killed for experimental purposes. Future directions for prehistoric archaeology in India. One should go beyond site assembly descriptions and artifact counts. We have to go beyond stone tools and start talking about wooden tools, bone tools, pigments, survey unknown areas and fill geographic gaps like Northeast India, parts of Himalaya, Ganga Plains, and many, many places across the subcontinent where many areas have not been surveyed. Target areas or sites that are in danger of destruction through rapid development. So one can do salvage archaeology also for a thesis. Start comparing Indian databases with those from other regions. This has not been done uh, at a large scale. Always obtain ASI permission before collecting stone tools. It is illegal for anyone to collect stone tools uh, and it's unprofessional also. And if you're an amateur doing it, it destroys the site, destroys the context, and keeping artifacts for personal collection, it does not help the subject. Use modern technologies and scientific methods as much as possible. Even if funding is not available, one can do these things through collaboration with scientists. So technologies and labs, scientific instruments are available through collaboration. And lab-based projects also require attention. You can uh, look at experimental archaeology. That's one idea. But also look at assemblages that were collected in the past and still unpublished or unstudied. That can also be done. It's not necessary to go to the field and make new collections all the time. Now we come to symbolic behavior. Before I get into rock art, I would just like to highlight that symbolic behavior actually starts earlier with the use of ochre uh, which was engraved, you can see in the top right from Blumbo's cave, 77,000 years old. And then we have these ostrich eggshells from South Africa and India and China, Levant, many places. Geometric patterns were engraved on all of these. It starts around 300,000 years ago, long distance transport of ochre. We don't have any direct evidence of utilization but they were possibly used for face painting, for coloring bones, maybe even rock art. We don't know at this stage, but we do know that ochre has been found at archeological sites in East Africa 300,000 years ago, and then later on in uh, cave sites and rock shelter sites. They were used for making pigments. The earliest evidence of painting, which is possibly uh, by Neanderthals, is older than 65,000 years, but it's controversial due to context and dating. But at the moment, we have to accept this because it was published properly and studied properly. So it might represent the earliest evidence of rock art by any hominid species. But what was the purpose of rock art? Was it for ritual, for decoration, as a warning? Did it represent memories? Was it a cultural territorial marker? Did it represent dreams? Or represented good luck before a hunt? Or storytelling? to attract mates. There are many, many 
uh, factors and reasons for the purpose of rock art. We cannot understand or pinpoint all of them, but different regions probably had different factors and different purposes. The locations of sites also matter. There was probably a view at the site of the valley, or there was acoustics of the shelter or cave. There were resources nearby, such as animals, water, vegetation, shelter. Sometimes the paintings were deep inside the caves, such as Europe, without any evidence of habitation. In some places, even in India, some panels were painted and others were left blank. And why do paintings overlap? Why did younger populations paint on top of older paintings? There's no clear evidence and reasons for that. What are the current issues with symbolic behavior in India? Currently is marginal compared to the global records. For example, compared to uh, Europe, South Africa, other places is very marginal. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind that very few sites have been excavated or dated in India. So we cannot talk about absence of evidence until we have studied the sites properly. We also don't know whether it was introduced to India or innovated or possibly both. Maybe some things were introduced and some behaviors were innovated. The oldest age of the paintings or any, any symbolic behavior is unclear. Now in Europe and Southeast Asia, the paintings are going back to 45,000 years ago. So in India, we probably have contemporary paintings, but at the moment, we have not been able to date them. And the record of symbolic behavior is uneven throughout the subcontinent. It includes paintings, etchings, engravings, and then stone beads, ushered eggshell beads, and other materials. There's also preservation bias. The, the things in South Africa and Europe are pre preserved properly because they come from caves and glacial environments. But in India, majority of evidence comes from rock shelters, so things have not survived. Now, just a broad, broad overview of the known rock art sites. So far, on publications. And as you can see, the distribution pattern is mostly absent in Thar Desert, Northeast India, and Maharashtra. But Maharashtra has a different evidence, and I'll show you uh, separately. So we have all these sites distributed all over different states. Majority are in Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, all these places. Some have pictograms, some have petroglyphs, some have copy. Some have engravings and etchings. I think here, many of you are familiar with the site where we have a range of paintings, so look onwards. So what is interesting is Meso the paintings continue. In then we also find microliths with these paintings and also pottery because the paintings were done in the Mesolithic, in Neolithic, in Chalcolithic, medieval times. So different ages, we have different associated materials in association with the paintings. Then we have things like termite mounds affecting the paintings, affecting the deposits. Then we also have vandalism taking place at some sites. Then we have natural elements like wind, sunlight, rain, all these factors, bioturbation, affecting paintings and associated evidence. Then we also have copules. copules. And some sites have many, many copules. The functions of which are exactly not known yet. We also have engravings, as we know, from Sangankalu on top of the hills on these large boulders. Here's a close-up, and most of them appear to belong to a uh, Neolithic phase and historical phase. And there's a diversity. So we have engravings more common in uh, Himalayas and South India, but paintings more common in Central India. In Maharashtra, we don't have rock art in the traditional sense on top of the uh, these laterite engravings now found in Goa along the Konkan coast, Maharashtra, Karnataka, maybe also Kerala. So these are drawn on the ground and then they were engraved 
possibly with stone tools or tools, the different types of engravings uh, preserved. For example, here we have an elephant, very large size. You can see the human figure. And then we have other animals, including marine animals as well. And this is also showing evidence of hippos and rhinos. So it shows that these are engraved. before the extinction of some animals. So material, characterizing the pigments on site and off site using different instruments and lab facilities. Remote sensing can be done. GS analysis can be done. And we can apply statistical methods to look at correlations and frequencies of paintings. and not applicable to all sites automatically. We need to include hunter-gatherer or travel groups and locals in identification and interpretation of individual paintings, and even as co-authors on the publications. This is rarely all rock paintings in one region or even one site. So different sequences will be present in different regions and, if, and the styles will also vary. So what is found in Eastern India will not be found in Central or Southern India. Different styles are overlapping at different levels. And we also keep in mind that there's possibly cultural or stylistic continuity. So some paintings may resemble is appropriate of age. And finally, the microliths are becoming older, going back to at least 48,000. So it's possible that some rock art is that old. However, maybe it has not survived. The oldest rock art may have faded. If it has faded, we cannot pinpoint it to be contemporary with the oldest microliths. Now methodology. We need to look at it from two levels, survey level in the field and analytical level afterwards. There's a need for standardization and documentation and reporting. Uh, I have noticed that everybody who studies rock art documents it differently, reports it differently. So basically there's no consistency or standardization across India in one format. There's also a need for use of DStretch, which is a software on site and in the lab. It should be mandatory because DStretch enhances the paintings uh, especially those that are not visible to naked eye. And this increases the number of paintings. And there's also a lack of quantification. Very few people count individual paintings. Very few people measure individual paintings. A scale in the photograph is not enough. And I'll explain why. <clears throat> Here's an example of D-stretch. On the left, we have original photographs. On the right, we have enhanced images after applying D-stretch. So you can see it increases the number of paintings. It brings clarity to, clarity to visible paintings. And there's many benefits, especially to pinpoint frequencies of paintings as well as superimposition patterns. So why count and measure individual paintings? It is hard work, but 
there is a benefit. There are many benefits, in fact. What information can we get by counting and measuring individual paintings from the rock shelters? It's more scientific and professional, first of all. We need to go beyond description. It can help monitor variable levels of fading. It can help in comparative purposes through a database. It can reveal more accurate functions of the site or panel. It can reveal importance of specific themes over others. For example, why are so many deer paintings found, but not ostriches? Was it a sacred taboo? Because we have ostrich eggshells found everywhere, but not paintings of ostriches in most of the sites. It's very strange uh, why certain themes are missing. It also tells us, it can tell us about geographic or territorial boundaries of specific cultural groups. Also tells us about intensity of site use in regional occupation. And it can help us hypothesize about the identity of the painters at the individual level, whether it was an expert or novice, whether it was a hunter-gatherer, a pastoralist, or a villager. We don't know who painted all these things. We assume there are tribals, but in the past, we have to keep in mind that tribals were sometimes replaced by later villagers and pastoralists in some places. Preservation and conservation, we can actually use 3D laser scanners and even just simple photography or uh, photogrammetry, especially for sites in danger, sites that are culturally important, and remaining sites. There's also ethical issues with living shrines. Some rock art sites have been turned into living shrines, especially uh, Hindu shrines. Should those sites be closed off? Should they be studied? How should they be studied? How should we interact with the worshipers? All this needs to be uh, addressed. The floors of the rock shelters need to be covered in all the shelters, not just select ones. If they're covered, at least they'll be safe from vandalism, from destruction, from natural processes. And salvage archaeology needs to be focused on sites and regions under destruction, especially sites that are being quarried, for example, or there's development happening like road building uh, or village expansion. Many, many things are happening and sites are getting destroyed. And those sites can be studied first and their sites in the remote areas can be saved for the future. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And if you have any questions, please contact me at the email address uh, on the bottom. Thank you.